Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmisano, and I'm the chair of the Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting here for Tuesday, November 1st. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Ellison is absent. Councilmember Osman. Present. Councilmember Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Present. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Chuktai. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Assinatrix. Councilmember Johnson is absent. Vice Chair Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. That's 11 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have two items on the published agenda today in addition to our reports that committees of committees that have met this cycle. Our first item is from our Race and Equity Subcommittee. So I will turn the meeting over. To, I'm going to give you a minute um, to the subcommittee's chair, uh, President Jenkins. I'm going to turn that over to, for a moment here, um, the subcommittee's vice chair, Jason Chavez, for this portion of the meeting. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Item one is a report from the Trans Equity, Transgender Equity Council updating us on their work. I'll invite track uh, from the city coordinator's office to give us that report. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Chavez and council members. I'm actually just gonna operate the PowerPoint, but I will pass it right over to one of the Trans Equity Council co-chairs and let them introduce themselves. Hi all, my name is Diana Anderson, my pronouns are they, them, and I am a co-chair of the Transgender Equity Council and have been serving since December of last year. I'm really excited to be speaking to you today. Um, my co-chair, um, Olivia, unfortunately couldn't make it, so it'll just be me. Um, I'll try to make it not as boring for y'all um, as I'm reading. So thank you for having us today. Uh, we want to highlight the work that the TEC has accomplished over the last year and the work that remains to be done and what requires council action. These recommendations were built by TEC members based on our community engagement processes over the past five years and most, many of these recommendations reiterate asks that we've already made. Our recommendations fall under four categories, city support for the work, resources, restrooms, and training. Our goal is to provide an extensive list of recommendations so that you can take action on whichever are most possible for you and to provide recommendations that span the gamut of budget asks, policy development, and staff action to ensure that multiple can be acted on at once. We will emphasize that this is the first section on city support for our work is the highest priority because without it, it would be much harder to implement any other recommendations. This year, for the first time since the trans equity work formally began at the, city, at, at the city nine years ago, we received a proposed budget funding increase beyond our usual 15,000. Furthermore, we put on a very successful ninth annual trans equity summit reaching 350 people and offering full hybrid programming for the first time ever. Lastly, we have begun to partner, been able to partner with HR in the initial phases of implementing the trans equity components of their DEI strategic plan. In order to see the community needs met, we know that the work needs for further support from the city beyond what is already proposed in the increase. We have worked with the REIB department leadership and confirmed their support for and interest in these proposed increases. While you didn't hear these particular asks in their budget presentation, because their presentation only spoke to the mayor's proposed budget, they agree with these identified needs. We recommend the following. We have been asking for trans equity staffing beyond the current level since the fall of 2019 and the transition of the Division of Race and Equity to a Department of Racial, Equ Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. It's the perfect time for this change to occur. We recommend that the addition of two full-time employees costing 279,000 total, including fringe, to grow the city's capacity for LGBTQ plus equity work. These roles should be classified as a division director and a program manager respectively, allowing the REIB 
to create an LGBTQ plus equity division, which they are interested in doing. Furthermore, we appreciate the proposed trans equity budget increase to $30,000. However, the trans equity summit alone costs close to 50,000 and it's still not paying community members equitably when they come and speak. Trans equity policy implementation work is significantly hampered by the lack of funding and the city has not had the funding or staff capacity to pursue the study of best practices for trans equity that we recommend, recommended last year. In order to cover the cost of next year's 10th annual summit, as well as increased community engagement and policy implementation, we request an additional 70,000 to bring the new division's budget to a total of $100,000. In addition, we recommend additional support for the city's appointed boards and commissions to improve effect effectiveness. The city is currently beginning a thorough review of its appointed board and commission structures, and we recommend developing a compensation plan for ABC board members as part of that review and request funding in the 2024 budget to implement that plan. In accordance with state level practices as laid out in Minnesota Statute 15059, and Ramsey County's Community Engagement Guide, we recommend compensating ABC members at a rate of at least $55 per attended meeting day. That works out to approximately an eight hour minimum wage day. If necessary, this could be applied based on income levels as done in Oregon state laws to make the overall proposal more affordable. We also recommend that the city restructure and simplify invoicing methods to ensure that all ABC members are compensated as outlined. Lastly, we recommend that the clerk's office create and share with all ABC members a directory of ABC membership to support collaboration across the boards. Our next set of recommendations is focusing on areas of necessary resources broken up into housing, safety, health, and other resources. Statistics show that trans Minnesotans are significantly more likely than their cisgender counterparts to have experienced homelessness or unstable housing, housing discrimination, threatened or actual violence, barriers to accessing health care, and disparate health outcomes. Furthermore, all of these experiences make residents more vulnerable, putting them at further risk for other types of exploitation. These recommendations present some initial solutions to these disparities. First off with housing. This year, we have worked with regulatory services to continue developing anti-discrimination webinars that we hope will soon be ready to pilot with property owners. In order to see our community needs met in terms of housing, we recommend the following. One, the city pass an ordinance requiring know your rights materials be provided to renters when they sign leases. These materials should be provided in the city's main languages, plus those that are increasing in commonality within the city. The, these materials should be supplemented by additional outreach and education by the civil rights and regulatory, regulatory services departments to vulnerable renters within Minneapolis. We also recommend that the city develop and pass the strongest possible version of a tenant opportunity to purchase ordinance. The city should develop an encampment response policy that prioritizes safety, dignity, and access to services and possessions for those living in the encampments. Specifically, we ask that the city council override the mayor's veto from last week on encampment response related staff directions. It is essential that the city pursue this research and that the research be done by the departments best equipped to do so. As opportunities come along to do so, the city should support community leadership in developing affordable trans-specific housing opportunities. On safety and health. In the past year, we've gotten language added to our legislative agenda that supports trans residents in Minnesota, specifically that supports a ban on the trans panic defense and opposes any transphobic bathroom, sports, and healthcare bills. In order to see our community needs met in terms of safety and health, we recommend that the city implement a municipal ID program, as we noted our support for in a previous letter to the council. We also recommend that the city work to implement other components of MIRAC's Immigrant Power Now platform. All of these actions would make our entire community, and especially trans immigrants, safer. 
The city should provide legal protections via executive order and eventually via ordinance as well for youth and families seeking gender affirming health care and for, for, for providers for that health care. In addition to legal protections, we have heard many community members voice the need for additional care resources and easier pathways to access those resources. We recommend that the city also provide funding equivalent to one FTE, either 64,000 if hosted at an ex external organization or 127,000 if hosted internally for a community organization to develop the directory of gender affirming care resources available locally as well as funding for an FTE to provide gender-affirming pediatric health care at a local clinic that would like to expand. The city's support of the Office of Neighborhood Safety to keep their work uh, focused on public health approach to violence prevention and to increase their number of community navigator roles, including an LGBTQ plus focused community navigator in order to best support our communities. We also ask that the city continue to explore options for medication-assisted therapy, therapy facilities. We also ask that the city repeal the loitering order, ordinance and support other components of our city's blueprint to end human trafficking, including continuing to fund the ARPA-funded End Human Trafficking Project beyond 2023. And we're really excited to see the Re Reproductive Access Fund in the proposed 2023 budget. Uh, we specifically recommend that the implementation of this uh, contain language that is included to ensure that the organizations selected to receive funding are able to provide gender affirming and inclusive care to all people seeking reproductive health care that makes their services easily accessible for all community members and are not crisis, crisis pregnancy centers. We also have a few recommendations that fall under resource provision but are not explicitly within either of these categories. Uh, specifically, we recommend so city support for continued development and funding, once appropriate, of the gender equity terms and conditions in the social services project. City staff and external partners have been working to develop a strategy by which we can eliminate perceived or actual barriers to service provision for trans residents, specifically targeting city-funded social services. We're enthusiastic supporters of this project and echo the ask that we're hearing from our partner departments. Please increase the REIB staffing and funding for trans equity work, as mentioned in our very first recommendation, in order to ensure that this project gets implemented effectively. City support for the creation of a community developed BIPOC and trans led LGBTQ community center. The city can do this by making a city-owned property available for free or affordable co-ownership for LGBTQ plus serving organizations working on creating that space and making funding available for staffing to support this work. And next, restrooms. Often our needs as trans individuals and LGBTQ individuals are reduced to restrooms and pronouns. Uh, and while both are essential for safety and health, we have intentionally prioritized some other recommendations first uh, in order to shift that conversation. Nonetheless, there are still some concerns with restrooms. This year, we've worked on implementing the Single Stall Gender Neutral Restroom Incentive Project, uh, which was funded through the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, we are in the process of doing multilingual outreach around that. Uh, and potential future multi-stall uh, gender neutral restroom projects in uh, businesses around the city. In order to see the community needs met in terms of safe restroom access, we recommend that civil rights staff develop and distribute know your rights materials on safe restroom access and that city council amend the 2023 budget to develop a program that would provide free menstrual products in the city bathrooms, in all city building restrooms, including the gender neutral and men's restrooms uh, for trans men who may use those restrooms. And uh, we are working on getting the exact numbers of how much this would cost, but that depends on how many residents use the buildings in a day, and that requires a data request. So we haven't got that information back yet, but TRAC will send that along when we have it. And then finally, uh, with training, we're just about wrapping up. Uh, 
we've been proud to work with HR and Minneapolis Employment and Training this year to get Gender Inclusivity 101 training rolled out to four city departments, as well as to our Minneapolis Employment and Training workforce development providers and to contract managers working with shelter and social service contracts. In order to see our community needs met, uh, we ask that the City Council amend the 2023 budget by adding $60,000 to the learning and development budget, covering a $30,000 contract for 201 level training, as well as $30,000 for expanding our existing 101 level training to all supervisors and managers as recommended in HR's DEI strategic plan. Thank you so much for your time. I've been so happy to serve on this council and to uh, serve in this position to advise the city on what to move forward on with regard to the LGBTQ residents. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your service on the TEC and more broadly to the city of Minneapolis. Um, these recommendations are certainly thorough and seemingly well thought out. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Uh, Council Member Goodman. I'm terrible with technology, but I have a young man helping me over here. That's good. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was interested in the comment with regard to a GLBTQ trans-friendly community center or space. Mm -hmm. It's something that had been happening in terms of discussions in my ward for many, many years. I'm just wondering, we were never able to find uh, an organization to kind of be the anchor tenant. And unfortunately, we've seen these kinds of buildings succeed initially and then completely go bust, like the Green Institute, which I helped get going, the um, Women's Foundation, the Women's mm -hmm. Minnesota Women's Center. So, is there an organization working on this, or is this just continuing to be kind of a fun um, idea and dream? Because if there was some there, there, I'd be mm -hmm. really interested in talking about it. But for years, mm -hmm. there hasn't really been anyone stepping up to do it. Yeah, we. Uh, it came up in our policy subcommittee recommendations because lots of LGBTQ Minnesotans don't have a space where they can go. Um, you're either going to like a bar or someplace where you have to spend money or like the public library where, where it's not as comfortable. And so that was what the need we saw was. Uh, we don't have a specific organization can I yet. That? Yeah, track has. Yeah. Um, Jerry Jenkins, Councilmember Goodman, um, committee members. Actually, since that policy conversation, I've been in conversation with Our Space, which is a BIPOC and trans-led community org that is working on creating an LGBTQ plus community center. So some of the language in that recommendation came out of a follow-up oh, I had right. with them after that meeting, um, and they are interested in working with the city to find a building and funding to make that happen. But they have been working on that for the past, since pre-pandemic, I forget exactly when. And uh, Madam Chair, um, yes. Mr. Tra Ms. Uh, <laughs> track I'm sorry <laughs> I apologize um, what about like quadrifoil and all of the other organizations that could potentially co-locate in a building like this I think that had been the vision we had also talked to Claire housing about doing a, an affordable housing project with a community center on the first floor is this particular because I mean when you say well we want to have somewhere where no one can spend any money then there isn't any way to operated if there isn't anyone spending money. Could you tell me a little bit more about kind of the idea and ideas for locations? Totally, and I can definitely follow up with our space more to get more information. I don't wanna speak for them, but from the conversation I had, they are very interested in co-locating a bunch of the organizations as you named. Um, so many of the LGBTQ serving organizations in the cities don't own their buildings, they rent, and some have gotten priced out or closed as a result of that. So there's an intention around having a building that is owned and multiple organizations can co-locate in it to, as you said, prevent things from shutting down and actually provide some of that sustainability and then they would operate as a nonprofit, um, I think is the intention right now. And if others know otherwise, please correct me if I'm wrong and would source funding that way as opposed to like a for-profit bar or business like Diana was talking about. Is there anything you wanna to add to that question? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you okay. got it. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to note that I'd be happy to work on and assist or continue the work in this area. Um, they had a location picked out in my ward at one point. So um, perhaps there is a way for me to be helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. And I would just add, I am a member of this group called 
our space collective. Um, you know, we have been talking to multiple organizations about co-locating in a space. We haven't identified a space yet. And certainly I think a part of the model would be like a coffee shop, a cafe, something that would generate some income, probably not enough to support an entire uh, building, but if we had multiple partners, um, that would certainly be a part of the the financial mix, as well as seeking uh, philanthropic support um, in addition to some city support. So it's um, it's a long term conversation, but it is underway, and appreciate your willingness to participate. Thank you. Um, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to our co-chairs as well as um, our amazing staff, uh, TRAC. Um, this is great ongoing work, and I also really appreciate the intersectional analysis that you bring mm -hmm. to your recommendations. Um, you know, housing, healthcare, public safety, these are all equity issues that disproportionately mm -hmm. impact our transgender and queer res residents. And I also want to know disproportionately impacts yep. um, queer residents of color and, and young uh, queer folks of color. Um, so these policies not only protect, you know, trans and queer residents, but they help protect all of us. Um, I did have a follow-up question around the training components. You mentioned that mm -hmm. there's four departments, but the recommendation is to, of course, get more mm -hmm. funding to uh, get to all of the, the departments. Um, so it's actually two questions. I wanted to know which of four departments are currently receiving it. And also, if there's any way um, in which as we're moving to expand that training to also include even folks up here on this diet, make sure that we're not, you know, misgendering um, anyone knowing like we're up on the, you know, best knowledge of how we can support um, trans and, and queer residents um, and make sure we have that full understanding ourselves as we're carrying out our, our policy making authority um, yeah. in this city enterprise. Yeah, I'm gonna let Track answer the specific question. Absolutely. Chair Jenkins, Councilmember Wansley, and committee members, thanks so much. I'm going to have to double check on the list of the departments that have gone through it. Um, I know there are a couple more in conversation and planning for it in addition to those four, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double check and I can get back to you all on that. Um, and it's been operating through HR Learning and Development so far, and I will be totally honest that I don't know how training for council members gets coordinated, but I'm sure <laughs> that they would be happy to work with you all on getting that to be something that our elected officials could go through as well. Did I catch both your questions or did I miss anything? Awesome. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion or questions or comments from my colleagues, once again, thank you for um, that presentation. And I will ask the clerk to uh, file this report. And um, I will now turn the chair back to Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Continue. Madam President. Thank you for that presentation. Our next item is an update on the improvement plan progress following the 2020 Civil Unrest After Action Report. I'll invite up Director Barrett Lane of Emergency Management to start that report. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Barrett Lane. I'm the Director of the Office of Emergency Management, and we're here to give you our Next, scheduled update on progress associated with the recommendations of the 2020 uh, Civil Unrest action, After Action Report. Uh, let me give you a quick overview of how we're going to proceed today, um, and then uh, and we'll get into the substance. Uh, as in the past, I'll take a moment here to talk about this enterprise-level effort that we've been calling the NIMS Reset. NIMS is National Incident Management System. Uh, and we are in the process of resetting our uh, sort of investment in that system as a result of the finding of this report. We will then turn it over to my colleagues in MPD, MFD, and communications to talk specifically about uh, projects that are assigned to those folks. So that's how we'll be proceeding here this morning or this afternoon. Here's where we've been. We received the report back in March. This, as I noted, is our third update uh, to you all on progress. 
As I, as I noted, we've really broken this work down into two main baskets, if you will. One is that NIMS reset, what can we do as an enterprise to respond to the findings that perhaps the greater weight of the report itself had to do with how we were using the National Incident Management System, how we were using the Incident Command System, which is part of that. Uh, so that's a big chunk of the work that we're doing at the enterprise level. Um, we're doing that through the Emergency Man Management Advisory Committee, although a lot of the uh, actual work has been shifted now under uh, Dr. Alexander's direction into the uh, Office of Community Safety since a good deal of the folks that are uh, responding to this uh, specific uh, after action report are within that office. But it does remind us that emergency management is a, is a shared uh, function with across the city and it involves health and public works and CPED and many, many other people that come together to provide this function at an enterprise level. So we have to make sure that we maintain those contacts as we go through our, our reorganization here. And then as I noted, there are a number of department level um, projects that uh, you will hear about as we go here to implement the improvement plan. Here's a quick scorecard. So uh, this is where we're at right now. Uh, the ones that are crossed off are done. The ones that are in gray are those which are deferred as part of that NIMS reset. So that's something that's going to happen over the course of the next 18 months or so as we do the training, testing, exercising associated with that. So some of those are going to be around for a while, but they're built into that plan. There are a few that um, we know are coming up. Uh, there are two right at the end of the list there that uh, I'm confident that OEM will deliver in Q1 of next year, so we'll have a couple uh, more to knock off the list there. So as you can see, we're making good progress on responding to these, and uh, we will be doing, as part of the year-end closeout here, a written uh, uh, report out on this so that you can see some of the detail associated with this above and beyond the, the um, verbal responses and ver verbal updates that you've been getting to date. So let me just uh, pivot then to the NIMS reset. Uh, you have seen this slide probably, probably too many times now, but uh, this really is the grounding uh, element that we're working on here. Uh, on the left side, or sorry, the right side of the slide, you'll see the four main elements that were really uh, brought into focus through the after action report findings. That is, how do we organize ourselves at the incident command level? That's that tactical response. How do we organize ourselves at the city's EOC, the Emergency Operations Center? That's that enterprise level support. The Joint Information Center, how do we work with it? Uh, that's under the leadership of city communications. And how do we work with those multi-agency coordination groups, specifically the mayor's um, MAC group, which is the mayor's emergency cabinet, and then the policy group that uh, is now going to be working through and with the council. So these are the components that we're really working on. We're going to isolate each one of them as far as, as making sure that people are trained uh, to implement these things, and then we're going to look at how each of these components interface with each other. And again, this, isn't, this is what we've been doing all along, so I just wanted to ground you in, in that. I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are all of the individual findings that, in a sense, are more symptoms of the fact that NIMS and ICS were not, uh, in the view of the report, implemented as it, as it should have been. Uh, as opposed to independent findings, and this, this is really the thread that ties the, the NIMS reset all together. So as you can see, any number of these have to do with how uh, one part of the organization or another uh, used the incident command system or staffed it. And then uh, goes on to the, to the next page here. As you can see, a good chunk of this really has to do with, with bundling this all together. The four objectives here, uh, just given the four components, uh, are probably not surprising. And again, this is just by way of reminder. We want to make sure the incident command system is used. It's used as designed. We want to make sure that the emergency operations center, again, is used and, and functions as designed, as well as the MAC group and the joint information center. So again, not anything new here. The overall timeline here is we're going to talk about how this is going to be adjusted, but as originally proposed, we were going to get this done by early 2024. The mayor has agreed to move this back. We've got some scheduling uh, issues with respect to the folks who need to get this work done. We want to be sensitive to that. We will get this done in 2024, but this gives you a sense of the multiple moving parts that are going into this project. 
Uh, on the top green line, we have to make sure that the whole city is refamiliarized with incident command system at the level that's appropriate for them. Some of those folks are going through online training. Other people are taking in-person training as it becomes available. This is something that we have to be committed to on an ongoing basis as staff are onboarded, as people get promoted or change jobs. This is something that we are, of course, now paying, well, have been, uh, paying ongoing attention to. So that's one thread that runs through this, and that's that green line at the top. Down at the bottom is now that is a blue line that has to do with as we build out those capabilities, we're testing them and exercising them, and we have to make sure that as, as we do that, that those learnings are brought back into the plans, that corrective action is taken. So again, that's another whole thread to this. The one I want to call your attention to specifically here is the mi middle line, and that really lays out the sort of building block pattern uh, associated with how we're doing the training and exercise. And it's not going to come together exactly like this as far as the timing goes. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but I think the sequencing is about right. So we have to start at the command level because everything really grows out of that. Looking at single command, police department act alone, fire department acting alone, the two teams coming together into unified command. Uh, then working with the EOC, then working with the policy group and the JIC. So you see that sequencing both in the training and exercises going through uh, that timeline. Ultimately, that leads us to what we've been calling that capstone uh, national level exercise, the Integrated Emergency Management Course, and I'll be talking a little bit of an update on that as well here before we, we conclude. So, But the goal of this whole project is to go back and revisit all of this fundamental material and make sure that by the time we go out to the Emergency Management Institute uh, that we can demonstrate uh, our proficiency in all of these systems and really respond to the AAR by showing our stuff at that point in time. And as, as I've said before, it is my intention that this, this team knock that ball out of the park at that time. I think we are completely capable of that. And my vision is that we will go there and really demonstrate on that national stage that we have processed this material and that we've mastered it, and we can demonstrate that both to you and to, to the community. This really kind of goes through the same. I'm just going to skip through that. Um, where are we at right now? So we've gone through and we have scoped and developed and put out on the street and got responses to a request for proposal for both the extensive training that's going to need to happen as well as the exercises. And in this context, exercises is really a testing function. What we want to do is use those exercises to validate the training has been absorbed, right? So um, we, we need to have that feedback so we can validate that, that uh, change is actually happening here. So we've got two separate RFPs out. We've got the responses back. And this week, we'll be making recommendations to that steering committee about uh, where we want to proceed with that. So that has been a big lift for our team. Uh, we were very close to getting those uh, uh, contracts inked here probably by the end of the month, early next month, and we'll be ready to roll into 2023 with that entire series of training and exercises. We're going to have to work with our partners who are going to be doing this work in the fire department, police department, communications, and elsewhere uh, to make sure that we can get a schedule that everybody can support. So we'll really sit down with the contractors once we have them on board and work out exactly what that dot pattern on the last slide looks like, exactly when are these going to happen and how can we sequence them. So that's the next piece of work. We need to identify the participants that are going to carry this work through. Right now we're working on what I would call kind of a cadre model. What we want to do is invest deeply into a, a proof of concept team from police, fire, and OEM, uh, make sure that we can run that group through from one end to the other, and again, I think really increase our success uh, when we get to the end product there and go out to Emmitsburg and, and show our, our capabilities. So uh, we will be implementing this plan starting um, in early 2023. So we've made quite a bit of progress here, and I think we're on track to get this, uh, to get this work done. And again, having this work done responds to, again, I, what I would call the greater work of the findings that are in there. We're going to have to go through and kind of close those out and make sure that each of them are addressed, but they will be addressed and should be addressed in the context of this overall recommitment to these processes. So that's the NIMS reset. I'm going to pause there, and then we'll get into department-level um, 
projects, and then uh, as part of that, I will turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, but I'm going to pause there and see if there's any questions specifically about the enterprise level work that's going on here. Thank you. There are a couple of comments or questions in queue. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, I was just going through and rereading the after action report, and you know, I, I think a lot of it hinges on we had a good plan. People didn't seem to be very well read on that plan, or at least implement it in the way that the plan had suggested. And so I'm just I want your first impression of uh, the difference between training that's being conducted right now with kind of hindsight about the importance of being well read on this plan compared to what your experience was prior to the event. Because obviously, when it comes to emergency preparedness, uh, you want to have the you want people well trained on the plan before there's an event. And so we're kind of trying to anticipate an event again. So I'm just curious, how are you seeing training rolling out this time around with this kind of new knowledge about the importance of training relative to maybe what had not worked in the past around training? Um, Madam Chair, Council Member. This is very much a forward-looking prospective program here. So what we want to do is take the learning that we have had and we want to change it to future behavior. So I mean, in that context, uh, we've made a lot of progress even with respect to fine-tuning our plans, and I'll talk about that in just a moment as part of our um, uh, ongoing OEM work. So we've got some good news to report there as well. Uh, Really, if you take apart the AAR, the After Action Report, uh, it, is, it has to do with the fundamentals that we're describing in this NIMS reset. We can't anticipate everything that's going to happen. We can't have a plan for every tactical problem that might, might occur. Uh, if we look at our threat and hazard risk picture, we want to make sure that we have standing plans for those things, but there are five or six things on that list, and most of them are things that you would guess, weather and heat and that sort of thing. Uh, we are in the process of, of revising, um, tuning, and socializing a civil unrest annex. We passed that annex in the last iteration of the, or the uh, emergency operations plan, and we have been working with our partners who are here today within the Office of Community Safety to implement that plan and make sure that we bring that down to the operational level. So part of the answer to your question is, you know, the, the emergency operations plan is fairly high level. We need to make sure that we bring that down to an operational level so that there are actually the SOPs and other supporting things within the system to make sure that that plan gets implemented. And I think that's the work that you're seeing specifically within that civil unrest space that's going on. Other hazards that we're more, I would say, used to, but we're more familiar with, like tornadoes and windstorms, I mean, that, that infrastructure has existed for a long time, so we, can, we know that's there. As we encounter these new things, we have to make those adjustments. Bringing all of that planning into uh, this set of training and exercises is exactly what needs to happen to address, I think, the concern, if I'm understanding it properly, that you're raising here, is that this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, these skills are not just generic skills. They need to be understood in a context but you can't get so close to the context that they become useless outside of that. So what we do is generally focus on what we call all hazards planning. So we want these plans to be specific enough to respond to things that we know about, but also flexible enough to respond to things we don't anticipate, because I'm not going to anticipate everything, and, and no, one, no one else is either. I think we're hitting that right mix by going back and looking at those systems that the incident command system, the national incident management system, those disciplines are what undergird our flexibility. Because if we don't have a specific plan, we rely on those processes to develop that one or adapt one we have on the fly. When those processes aren't robust, we don't have that adaptive capability to the extent that we should. So it's a long way of answering your question, I suspect. And if I didn't hit it exactly, let me, please let me know, council member. But, um, the planning and the execution have to go together. So if we look at how any of these capabilities are built, we look at the plan, we look at the organization, who's going to execute the plan, we look at the train or the, or the equipment. Do they need specialized equipment to execute the plan? Then you test it. Can the people take the equipment and the plan and go do what they're supposed to do? 
and then you prove it in an exercise, and if the exercise identifies gaps, you fix them, whatever needs to be fixed. That's exactly the process that we're on at this point in time. So there is this play between the plan itself and people needing to know about it and to be familiarized with it, but also having enough of the basic how to play the game skills to be able to adapt when that plan doesn't specifically address whatever happens to be in front of you. I think specifically what I was trying to also get at is, are people more engaged in the training or has the training been modified in a way that makes it connect with people more compared to in the past? Like how has the training been informed by the after action report is kind of what I'm getting at. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I think the, the biggest advantage we have now is within the Office of Community Safety. I think we have everyone at the table and Commissioner Alexander is making sure that the priorities are clear, that alignment is expected, and that everybody's working together. And I think that's the number one driver that's, I think, engaging us in the training and this whole process at a level which uh, is vastly improved to what we've seen in the past. So, I mean, I think just that, that one change and that realignment has provided us with the organizational structure to, I think, accomplish what people always wanted to accomplish, but it just didn't quite, quite gel as we all hoped it would have. I think that that issue, in my experience within the last few months, has really come together well. And if we want to talk specifically about the civil unrest, the amount of planning and engagement we've had from our partners uh, and the commitment uh, from Chief Huffman and her team has been outstanding. And we, and we saw that in a tabletop exercise just last week where, uh, you know, I think the, the level of engagement and the learning that's going on was really, really quite good. So I think that there's a lot of progress being made there. And again, I don't want to point fingers at anybody in the past. The past is the past. But I can say that right now, Things are running well, people are engaged, I think learning is going on, and I really do believe that if we put our mind to it, we're gonna knock the ball out of the park in 2024. Thank you. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director Lane for that presentation. Um, I think you mentioned that there is a committee that will be reviewing the RFPs that you have out Currently, um, who who makes up that committee, and, um, and, and then what kinds of organizations provide that type of training? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council President, so the, the as part of our reorganization here, and to a certain extent to fill the gap between the beginning of the year when we started this work and the. Uh, formalization of the Office of Community Safety, and we had to move this work while that reorganization was taking place. Mm -hmm. We pulled together the department heads of the major internal groups that support or work in emergency management. So ourselves, uh, police department, the fire department, communications, the city attorney's office, health, and uh, public works. I think this is the group that has come together as what we call the Emergency Management Steering Committee. Did I miss anybody? I don't think so. The city coordinator's office is also in that group. Um, that's, those are the owners, if you will, of the broader emergency management function across the enterprise. And so that's the sounding board that we've been using to sort of tee up this whole work and make sure that it is working with and aligned across the enterprise beyond uh, the folks that are now resident within the Office of Community Safety. So we're using that as sort of a broader scope. So that's the people who are going to be talking to. Ultimately, uh, is, I think the decision-making is going to be made within the office, but uh, we do want that informed by other folks who are stakeholders in this. There are a number, to answer the second part of your question, there are a number of contractors that specialize both in uh, training, uh, testing. We've used these folks in the past. We are a small enough shop that uh, we don't have a lot of sort of organic, if you will, um, standing, testing, and uh, exercising capability. We are going to be beefing that up. But we have relied on contractors over the last, well, forever, to be honest with you, to come and build that capability with us on a case-by-case -case basis. So there are groups that do this very specifically. Um, we got good responses to both, uh, both RFPs, so I think we've got some... Um, 
interesting things to talk about internally before we make that decision. So these, excuse me, Madam Chair, uh, locally, these groups are local? Um, Madam Chair, Council President, largely these are national organizations that we're seeing bid on these. These are really, really big projects. I mean, you're talking about multiple exercises and functional exercises that require big levels of support. Uh, I think I probably said it before, this is not going to be inexpensive and it's not going to be easy. Uh, these are a large scale logistical thing when you start talking about exercises or training of you know several hundred people within the context of 18 months to two years. It's a big lift. So we're seeing national level engagement around this. Okay, and then how far down in the organization do we anticipate that training going? For this particular component of it, Madam Chair, uh, Council President, uh, we are going to focus on the identified cadre of police, fire, emergency management, joint information center, um, the people who would be involved in that. We have to identify specifically who those individuals are. There's a trade-off here. We're trying to train everybody all at the same time and the bandwidth associated with that, particularly given the resource challenges that we find, particularly in the police department, you know, they're going to have to make bandwidth in the normal conduct of their duties to, to attend this training. And I think we can't, we can't uh, lose sight of that. That's an opportunity cost for them, and it, it doesn't come for free. So we're trying to set a balance between getting enough people trained to this. We have a core team that understands the benefit and you know, eventually then trying to push it out laterally across all the organizations, because really anybody who would come up to be an incident commander in any of these organizations, including health or public works, would need to have the basic skill set necessary to do this work. So right now we're going to focus on a relatively small cadre of people that are going to take us through to 2024, but obviously the, the, the project is going to have to expand as we have the capability to broader than that group of people. Thank you, sir. I put myself in queue briefly. I know we still have department level projects to go over, but I, I don't want to ignore what you just said, the internal cost of, uh, of this training. But could you remind us about how we will be budgeting for this training in terms of outside needs um, it, and, and for this you know, operational transformation that we're, we're embarking on here. Are there public dollars or grants to help us out uh, to, get, to get us to this better place? Uh, Madam Chair, at this point in time, we, the financing, we've worked with the finance department to find city money to, to fund this work. That's basically one-time money. Uh, to the extent that we can find grants or other training that's available for free, we're going to take advantage of that. One of the biggest drivers in this is the timing that we want to execute it on. So a lot of this training we can get through a grant or through FEMA, but they'll only come out once a year and they'll come out when they can kind of make it. If we want to keep this on track and, and really make change quickly, we're going to have to uh, in-house a good deal of this with our own contractors. So we do have a financing plan in place. We've talked with finance and the city coordinator about it. Um, so we have the resources to bring this forward. To the extent that we can find ways to make it less expensive, we're certainly going to do that. One of the, one of the depending on which contract we, we end up with, and I don't want to get too deep into that because we have you know, open contracts or open RFPs to evaluate, um, you know, there's a back and forth about can we bundle these things together? Are people willing to take um, training that is uh, not in person as opposed to in person training? There are other ways to try to control the costs. But, uh, if you if you want to get this done, um, I think we should we should just dig in and get it done, and that's the approach that we're taking. Thank you, Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a very direct question: Are you and your organization prepared if there is another riot? Yes. We're certainly prepared. We're better prepared than we were. We have a specific plan in place. Are we as prepared as we want to be? No. But we'll never be as prepared as we want to be. Uh, but we have made great strides both with, in, with intern, within, inside OEM, but also particularly with our fire and police partners to improve our ability to respond 
now. And the challenge that the commissioner gave us, um, I think literally our first meeting was, what would you do if this happened right now? What would you do if you happened right now? I think we've made great strides toward answering that question. We have a plan in place. Uh, we will be able to execute that plan. Is it optimized? No. No, we've been you know, working on that for a matter of months to years, depending on, on how you want to measure the start date. Um, but I am confident at this point in time that we would see a, a different approach to that between the, the changes to the Office of Community Safety and the planning that's been done in the meantime. Uh, I think you'd see a significant difference. The tabletop exercise that we just did demonstrated that we've come a long way. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. But we do have a plan. We will execute that plan if it happened right now, as we're sensitive that that's a real risk. I'm not seeing anybody else in queue, Director, if you want to go on to the department. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to go through my part pretty quick because I've covered some of this already. There are, we have five things in this list. There are two that uh, OEM is, is responsible for. We expect to deliver these in early 2024. Some of it, I think, really needed to wait till um, leadership in the police department has, has, uh, has transferred here. Uh, but we've done the groundwork necessary. Uh, that has to do with the civil order public protection, civil disorder public protection activities or actions and curfew waivers. Um, one thing that we've crossed off the list is the after action reports. That's something that OEM is certainly willing to do, and I believe the commissioner expects us to take a key role. So that is just, we've just taken care of that one. The um, training and testing and exercises, the regular ta tabletop exercises, we've talked about quite a bit, so I'm not going to go through that. Again, except to again appreciate the investment that our partners have made in this in the last few months has really been uh, great to work through and a, and a significant uh, um, a significant help. So my hat's off to all of them. The NIMS reset training we just talked about. Um, those incident command system trainings are being held as scheduled. We just talked about the RFP and the final evaluation phase. We got a little bit ahead of this. Uh, one of the findings, these are the two things that we'll deliver then in, in early 2023. Uh, as you know, we had some issues with respect to the curfew and who would be exempt from those curfews and the process necessary to, to evaluate and routinize those requests. We've got the legal work done, thanks to the city attorney's team for the legal support on this, and now that's back to OEM to operationalize that within the context of the legal work. So uh, we will be uh, working on the operational plan on that. And again, my hope is to deliver that early next year. The ongoing exercises that uh, the civil unrest tabletop uh, I just touched on again, uh, with great support within the Office of Community Safety, appreciate that. Uh, we ran us, uh, supported the uh, cybersecurity elections tabletop and we've got a couple more uh, exercises planned here, the damage assessment, and then we'll be doing one for the multi-agency coordination group as we go forward. That is, um, oh, and I, I should have stopped on the slide before. The other open item for us to deliver in early 2023 has to do with public protective actions. So what is it that we're going to tell the community uh, they should do to be prepared for civil unrest? And that is a surprisingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, con uh, complicated issue. We've done the research associated with it. Unlike just about any other hazard you can think of, there's not a standard go to the FEMA website and download the green brochure uh, kind of help on this. This is something we're going to have to make some policy decisions about ourselves and has some significant um, implications for kind of how, the, how community uh, perceives us and vice versa. So we want to make sure that we're careful about that. Uh, so we'll be having some ongoing conversations about that uh, in 2023 and then you know, try to get that message out to folks because that's something that they, they certainly need to hear and expect from us. So that wraps up OEM's um, uh, part of this. I will pause there if you have any questions about a couple of those things I went through fairly quickly. Uh, otherwise, yep. I will turn it over to to D.C. Schoenberg, who is standing on in for Interim Chief Huffman, who had a conflict today. 
Thank you. Before you do, Council Member Wansley has some questions. Thank you. Um, I just actually had a question around that last comment around um, getting some type of policy in place uh, for basically the public. Um, in that process, will you be working to also include like listening sessions with community? Because um, what I've found to be the most inspiring of that time, and I know there were several of us council members that were involved in doing community defense um, in the absence of law enforcement and basically city leadership that entire time, um, community members who actually did really well um, to figure out their own community defense strategies um, during that phase. And it would be great to have those community members also be able to elevate some of the expertise that they developed in that, that time um, to really keep their community safe. Um, so I think it would be great if we could also see um, residents as an ally in that work because they literally showed up and showed out for all of their neighbors. Um, they created infrastructures that from my understanding are even still in place to like create community cohesion in their uh, neighborhood to support safety um, and just an overall sense of well-being within their neighborhood. So it seems like we should also be creating space for our constituents to actually give really good feedback on that process because they did it. Right, uh, Madam Chair and, and Council Member, I certainly, you know, the, the community's um, input into this is going to be key. So um, we all have more experience in this than we want to at this point. So it would be not wise to leave that on the table. Council Member Chavez. Uh, Chair Palmasano, thank you. And thank you, Director Lane, for this update. <clears throat> I think on slide number one, it shows that, no, on slide number five, recommendation number one, it shows that it technically hasn't been implemented so I do want to talk a little bit about the community engagement component. I think to Councilmember Rainville's point, if we're going to be prepared for an uprising, should another one come, I think that in order for us to be prepared, we do need to do that community engagement component because we will never recorrect our bad behavior from the past if we don't listen from the community members themselves. So I think that recommendation number one should be the number one priority over everything, and then we implement everything else to make sure that we're actually recorrecting our behavior from the past. Um, I know that I've heard from people on Lake Street in the third precinct that they still need an apology from our police department, that they still need an apology from the city, and that they need that community engagement component to get engaged. So I'm wondering if you know, or if your department is gonna be leading these community engagement meetings or, or how they're gonna be conducted and who's involved and who's engaged and who's invited to the table to make sure that like when we're developing these recommendations um, that they're implemented with the community members in mind. Madam Chair, Council Member, that's actually gonna come up during um, uh, Ms. Bergstrom's part of this, this presentation. So those are one of the uh, elements that have been sort of divvied out, if you will, to uh, various uh, subject matter experts within the, sit within the city. So I would ask you to uh, respectfully, let's put a pin on that and when uh, Ms. Bergstrom comes up and, and gives us an update on that. I think you'll have some more insight into that. Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you recommended that. I'm really looking forward to the slide on recommendation one around uh, centering community conversations and engagement around this process. I also want to take a step back and hope that this entire uh, plan is about not being prepared for another riot, but to absolutely do everything that we can to not create conditions for an uprising to take place in the, in the beginning, to make sure that there's not another officer on the streets that will stand on somebody's neck for nine minutes, to make sure that there's accountability over officers that do engage in misconduct, to build that trust with this new public safety system, to make sure that your plan is also building that trust with the public that, again, we are not just preparing for harm, that we're actively doing everything that we can on this body to make sure that we do not have another racial reckoning in Minneapolis. Um, so I really hope that that is actually the goal for this body um, and doing every we, everything we can to mitigate that versus saying, if it happens, that if it happens again, that's a failure on us. So I do want that to be a centralized focus in this plan, not to just be prepared to do everything so we don't have to put our residents through that again, as well as the world of seeing another black man be executed. That should be the goal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member, message received. Thank you. 
Did you want to introduce Deputy Chief, Chief Schoenberger? Deputy Chief Schoenberger, welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm Deputy Chief Troy Schoenberger. I represent the uh, Police Department and the Professional Standards Bureau. And I uh, just want to start by thanking Commissioner Alexander and Director Lane for their leadership in coordinating this reset uh, of NIMS. And uh, from my uh, response to the 35W bridge collapse in 2007, I had an opportunity to see what it looks like um, when a locally coordinated and then state and federal response um, comes together and works well. Um, so uh, for my career, um, and I've responded to almost every major incident um, since that time, had an opportunity to see the model of what a response should look like versus um, one where we can do much better. So um, for the police department, uh, one of the goals is to uh, continue this work um, to better prepare ourselves for uh, the next event. So um, these are the recommendations uh, provided in the after action report. Um, I'll go through uh, most of these uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, starting with recommendation for a workforce analysis of leadership training. Uh, starting with a workforce analysis discussion with human resources, um, these uh, conversations are ongoing. Um, going back to 2015, uh, we were doing a lot of good work with a consultant, um, working to identify the, um, the skills of all of the leaders within the police department, um, looking at what um, career development they need, and so um, looking to dust off some of that work, refreshing it, and um, starting to um, re-implement some of those conversations uh, to ensure proper leadership development throughout the police department. Uh, among uh, or as part of that, our promotional process, um, the recommendation is to ensure that the knowledge, skills, and abilities um, are included in the promotional process. Our vendor for um, my entire career has been IO Solutions um, as part of our promotional process. Uh, every, uh, every other promotional cycle, uh, they require uh, that the KSAs be reviewed again. And so um, subject matter experts within the department are brought together to establish um, the, the current KSAs. So that is something that's ongoing. Um, and we did just do that for both the sergeant and lieutenant promotional process um, this year. Sorry if I missed this, Deputy Chief. KSAs, key service areas? Uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Knowledge, skills, and abilities. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Uh, and those are, those are identified through a written test a, um, a skills assessment test and um, the interview process. Uh, the other recommendation is to invest in additional training and leadership development opportunities. Um, we started that this year. Um, we have um, re-established our relationship with um, FBI's LEDA, that's the Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. Um, they have a three-part series of leadership development and we have started sending sergeants and lieutenants through that. It's something that we've used historically um, but not so much recently, and so that's among the leadership development courses that we've, um, we've started using again. Uh, looking to um, develop uh, a, a more robust review of um, pathways through career, so um, sort of goes back to the original workforce analysis, um, looking at um, what skills our staff currently have and what, develop, what developmental opportunities might be beneficial to them um, whether that's a new assignment, um, a new opportunity to lead in a different area of the department, or uh, a training that they need to sort of round out their skill set. Um, and then uh, looking at developing leadership succession plans, uh, as we know that um, current leaders will eventually be retiring um, or stepping down, uh, we know that we need to have a, a good succession plan in place and that there's people that are properly trained and ready to lead at the next level when the opportunity arises. Recommendation six is specific to the civil disturbance policy. Uh, and for us, that's policy 7-805. Uh, this is something that was uh, revised uh, immediately following um, the civil disturbance in 2000 and continues to be revised as we identify new best practices. Um, so the, uh, the policy language um, is currently under review um, because the Minnesota Post Board recently uh, released a, a policy recommendation. It's not a model policy, so we're not required um, to incorporate it into our policy. But we've looked at the Post Board recommendation policy 
and the International Association of Chiefs of Police model policy and are uh, using that to ensure that our policy is consistent with both of those. And that is in final draft. Um, it's going out for um, concurrence shortly. Recommendation 10 is specific to the less lethal munitions policy. Um, all of these were updated uh, in uh, June of 2020, um, and some of them have been updated more recently um, as necessary, but um, as a result of uh, the uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights TRO um, and other uh, best practices, we've been able to modify some of those policies to ensure proper oversight of less lethal munitions uh, during civil disturbance. Uh, as far as additional policy highlights, um, we've created authorization uh, processes for the use of crowd control weapons. So when there is a civil disturbance, um, a identified staff member at the level of deputy chief or higher is required to give permission to use less lethal munitions. Uh, and uh, each of us uh, is equipped with a, um, a manual that we would essentially take with us to a civil disturbance uh, command post uh, to ensure that uh, we're giving the proper authorizations when necessary. Uh, we've also restricted that only SWAT will carry 40 millimeter launchers during civil disturbance. Um, we can extend that authority to others who are properly trained. Uh, most often, this will come in the form of, say, the bicycle rapid response team, who does have to have this um, weapon uh, generally cased um, and uh, slung uh, around their back, we'll say. Uh, but um, should it be needed, it would be nearby and available to them. Uh, one authorization is given. We've also updated many other definitions um, and uh, reporting requirements uh, to ensure that uh, whatever action we take is properly documented. Recommendations 11, 12, and 19. Uh, recommendation 11 is leadership over continuity of service. Um, we've identified um, command staff level members who will oversee uh, activities not related to a civil disturbance. Um, so while uh, in a large scale event, um, much of the command staff is gonna be staffing um, the command post or the, the incident command center, uh, we still need to have leadership that oversees the rest of the city and anything not related to that. So um, that plan is in place. Recommendation 12, um, civil, service, or civil unrest resource, resource planning. Um, MPD and Public Works uh, instituted a collaborative plan to ensure um, that infrastructure protection resources are in place. Um, typically this looks like um, sort of a quick response to uh, protecting the precincts from harm, whether that's putting up fencing or additional security measures. Um, having a, um, a relationship and a plan in place with Public Works is extremely important to ensure that um, occurs quickly and smoothly. And then recommendation 19 is specific to com camera control um, and uh, more specifically that MPD and not Office of Emergency Management will control the cameras um, to ensure public safety. So um, internally our policy was updated um, to reflect that uh, generally the cameras are monitored at the strategic, or the EOTF I should say, and um, just making sure that MPD has control over those cameras and that there's no territorial arguments over who is gonna have control over the camera. Recommendations 22, 24, and 25, um, crowd control training. This has been incorporated um, throughout the department, um, both during uh, initial uh, onboarding with new employees, um, as well as during in-service uh, for all employees. And then uh, there's additional training mandated for the mobile field force uh, teams, and uh, their, their skill set is uh, a little more unique, and so um, they have additional training and then employee wellness. Uh, we recently uh, issued an RFP for wellness services. Um, a vendor was selected, and uh, I am hopeful that in the very near future, uh, you'll receive a presentation on that. Um, right now, they're working through the contract uh, for services, and we hope to have that in place very soon uh, so that we have a robust wellness program um, and services available to ensure um, that all of our officers are healthy and receiving the psychological services that they need. Exist, uh, existing services for wellness currently include 
um, the MPD Wellness app, and we do have a wellness team uh, who also provides support for the peer uh, support team, and, uh, and then we have additional mental health services that are available on a smaller level, uh, and uh, the fitness uh, for duty process um, and critical incident debriefings are all processes that are part of the wellness team and wellness services. Uh, finally, uh, recommendation 25, investigation surge capacity. Um, during the civil unrest, um, the, the number of complaints that came into the Office of Police Conduct Review completely overwhelmed the system, and um, we uh, are still dealing with um, some of that fallout and, uh, and working through all of the complaints that were received then. Um, so uh, Office of Police Conduct Review and the City Attorney's Office um, having identified a um, source of um, investigative support in, in the form of uh, a law firm that can provide investigative resources, and that has been very helpful as they've taken on roughly 25 uh, case investigations and, um, and helped with that investigative need. That is all I have, um, but I'm available for questions before I turn it over to Mayables Fire. Thank you, there are a few. Um, Council Member Chavez is in queue. I believe it was around recommendation nine, but I'll let him. Yes, uh, just a quick one. I just wanted to know if you could share with us what the change or latest draft on the civil disturbance policy is, or how we can get access to that, or is just, was that office, or is that recommendation just being worked on internally with the mayor's office? So, um, that policy is, um, is out for concurrence, which means it goes out to um, the entire command staff, goes to the city attorney's office, um, and the police federation for con concurrence. Um, ultimately, it's consistent with the IACP model policy and the post board model policy, so it should look very similar to that, um, but once it is um, complete, uh, and by the way, the post board model policies require that our policy be um, identical, if not substantially similar. Uh -huh. So it, it does have to follow very closely to that. Um, but once that is uh, completed, then it will it will be public. Thank you. And do you know much about the post board policy? Or should I, I can look it up too, but just. It would probably be better uh, to just look it up. For sure. um, I, I, I am familiar with it, but um, our, our current policy is not m very dissimilar than that. Okay, thank you. Is that it? Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, in regards to slide, I think it's recommendation 25, the investigative capacity uh, search or search capacity. Um, so we've had a couple of these and I typically ask the question about how many officers have been disciplined in light of 2020. I'm assuming this recommendation is to help with that, but you mentioned there's 25 cases that's gonna be handled through this process do you have an updated figure though as of now have we moved beyond just the one or are we still at that one that has been officially disciplined madam chair council member wansley um, i don't have the exact number um i uh i know that more cases have been completed mm -hmm. um, but are not yet at final disposition so i would not be able to speak to that those specific cases do you have a sense of how many are still in review so um, specific to the civil disturbance, I believe the number is five. Okay, thank you. Was that all Council Member Wansley? Council President Jenkins. Thank you, uh, Chair Pomisano and Deputy Chief Schoenberger. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of national organizations, law enforcement organizations are um, thinking or predicting, in fact, that if we have uprisings in our city, it's most likely going to be um, right-wing extremists, uh, particularly around the elections, which we have coming up next week. Our, how are we tracking that kind of data if we are and preparing for those kinds of scenarios? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, President Jenkins, uh, our Strategic Information Center does actively monitor 
um, many sources of information. Um, we receive updates from federal government, uh, from local officials, and so um, there is a fairly uh, robust uh, investigative, um, we'll call it, uh, review of current events to ensure that we have as much information as possible to prevent or respond uh, quickly to an incident if it were to arise. Are we getting any intel to this point about the, that potential? Uh, that is not um, something that I would be at a, uh, a point to discuss here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else in queue. Thank you for your Thank time, you. Deputy Chief. Looks like you're passing it off to the fire chief. Welcome, Chief Tyner. Good afternoon. All right, let's see. I hope to push the button. All right, button. Okay, so we just had a couple of items uh, surrounding uh, NIMS, ICS, uh, spanner control, and resource tracking. So first, just to uh, kind of lay the groundwork in regard to NIMS, uh, NIMS could training, training for us as the uh, fire department consists of the following certifications, uh, ICS 100, uh, 200, 300, 400. I forgot to put a C in those last two, but ICS 700 and 800. Uh, it requires that we're all certified in, it, excuse me, let me start again. We're all required to be certified in ICS 100, 200, 700, and 800, and we all received that during our initial training uh, in our cadet classes in rookie school. Um, FEMA recommends that chief officers be trained and certified in ICS 300 and 400, and most of us are, uh, but the ones that weren't, our newer chiefs, uh, we sent that through this uh, last class that uh, Director Barrett put on for ICS 300, and they will be continuing on in the upcoming ICS 400. So uh, 300 is complete. Uh, our 400 is upcoming, uh, but we hope to also put, start putting through some of our captains that will likely uh, be seeking promotion uh, to open chief's <clears throat> positions as they come up also through that training. Chief, can you just help us colloquially understand what ICS 300 is maybe? Uh, because ICS 300 and 400 deals with a higher level, more uh, uh, complicated incidents. I see it, the ICS 100, 200, 700, and 800 kind of deals with the ICS systems when uh, we have a single incident, like a house fire or something like that, where it's just fire and it's a uh, you know, simple for our terms, incident. Uh, 300 and 400 deals with those larger incidents like uh, the civil unrest or or tornadoes and things like that. They require a much bigger response and a much bigger uh, ramping up of the ICS system. So several needs at once. Several needs at once or several locations. Or several locations. But much more complicated incidents. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so span of control, the recommendations regarding span of control were actually identified by us through our own after action reviews prior to the uh, Hillard Highs report. And so luckily we were able to get a head start on that in many of these things. Some of the adjustments that we completed prior to the Chauvin trial were to assure that the fire chief or uh, the designee are physically present within the unified command structure. Uh, we also uh, took steps to ensure that chief officers are assigned to the multi-agency command center and also to the Minneapolis Emergency Communications Center. And we've also included that in our standard operating procedures or standard operating guidelines, if you will. Uh, we've also took steps to ensure that the span of control does not exceed the optimum number, which is four to six. Uh, you can go up to seven, but four to six is optimal and uh, or that you don't have more direct reports than that on any level through the, uh, throughout an incident. Uh, we also committed to expand the ICS system as needed, which is where 300 and 400 comes in, uh, to maintain that optimum span of control 
And we've also included that in our standard operating procedures. <clears throat> uh, resource tracking is uh, primarily the function of the chief officer assigned to the Minneapolis Emergency Communications Center that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we do that through the CAD system, uh, but we're able to do that 24 seven through the CAD system. And, and we actually did during the uh, civil unrest and we continue to do it that way. Uh, we are pursuing software upgrades to <clears throat> improve that tracking ability and really to help communicate situational, aware situational awareness uh, to people in the stations and also at home. Uh, we haven't got there yet, but uh, we have some ideas about that. Uh, but the system utilizing GPS provides us with resource tracking on every MFD apparatus. It lets us know their location, their status, their availability, uh, any updates or communications that were broadcast over the radio, uh, response times, how long they've been on scene, how long it took them to get on scene, and a lot of other information. So we have that covered pretty well. Finally, uh, recommendations 13 and 21 were <clears throat> in response to communications. Uh, and that was, well, actually, that's not mine. That's for communications. So <laughs> I'll stop there <laughs> and uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I, um, I don't see anyone in queue. I'll give it just a couple more moments. Nope. Looks like everybody's understood this perfectly. Thank okay, you. thank you. Next, I'll I was ready to go. invite our <laughs> Director thank Bergstrom. Welcome. Uh, oh, thank you, Chief Tider. Uh, Chair Jenkins, uh, Council Members, my name is Greta Bergstrom, and I am here as the Interim Engagement Deputy, and I will be speaking on behalf of uh, five different recommendations, um, two which apply to the Communications Department and two which apply, or three which reply, excuse me, three which uh, apply to neighborhood and community relations. Whoops. Um, so this past quarter, the third quarter of 2022, um, the city concluded um, an RFP process as well as approved a contract with public affairs and crisis communications consultant Tunheim Partners to provide additional capacity and strategic counsel where needed and also to help develop um, and work as partner in developing a crisis communications plan. At the end of September, we did hold an initial immersion meeting with Thunheim. Uh, that included the city coordinator, uh, the commissioner of public safety, uh, the city attorney, and communications staff from both the mayor's office and communications, um, as well as MPD, I should say. Uh, we are working with Thunheim and communications staff right now on developing the plan, but we're in the very early stages. Um, I want to emphasize that key to developing this plan will be understanding internal information flow and communications protocols really resulting from the city's new executive restructure. Um, this will really help to lay the foundation of crisis communications and align with the NIMS standards to support incident command. Staff from communications department um, do continue to participate in the tabletop exercises and trainings that have been led by the Office of Emergency Management. Um, our role uh, within communications and, and helping guide the broader communication staff in the city is to lead and staff the joint information system or joint information center in times of crisis or um, in times of critical incidents or even large events like the Super Bowl. Um, we want to always ensure that the right information is getting to the right people at the right time. We recognize that that has definitely not happened in the past. Part of the reason we're here, of course, is to explore these recommendations um, that were brought forward in the after action report. Um, I would also like to say, uh, related to the uh, second um, communications um, recommendation 21, a critical incidents protocol was updated in February of this year. Um, that's a protocol that really guides public information release um, in terms of critical incidents, um, an officer involved shooting, for instance, making sure that we are doing a better job of coordinating information um, and approving that information before it's shared publicly to make sure that it is accurate. Um, additionally, we're working to align both an updated critical incidents protocol, so the one that was updated in February, 
with a, a developed functional public communications annex that we developed with the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, in terms of NCR, neighborhood and community engagement, um, the after action report did outline three recommendations for the city to pursue related to public engagement. Those are being advanced primarily by neighborhood and community relations, um, but also in conjunction with several other departments in the enterprise and with communications. Um, these include recommendations on improving and understanding future public response with community, um, the listening sessions um, and, and other options that we could pursue um, to make sure that we are understanding what community needs, how they did respond in the past, and how the city could better support and provide information. Um, these include Minneapolis residents. Uh, it also includes business owners, specifically uh, ideas for a business owner forum, or again, uh, getting a better understanding and engaging with business owners on what could go better in the future. Um, and potentially developing a constructive conversation team, um, and that would need to be done in collaboration with the Minneapolis Police Department and with Commissioner Alexander as well with the Office of Community Safety Lane. Uh, we know that we need to do better both at informing uh, community and in listening to community in times of crisis. We're learning from 2020 in order to improve systems and information sharing going forward. The top priority is aligning protocols and structures internally now, uh, given the new enterprise structure. A lot has changed within the city, and so there are a lot of opportunities uh, moving forward. Now that the new structure was approved by council, departments charged with communications, engagement, and public messaging, specifically NCR and communications, have been revisiting the Hillard Hines recommendations. Over the next two quarters, really starting in this quarter and in first quarter of 2023, we'll be prioritizing work with the new Office of Community Safety, the lane of those five departments, as well as other enterprise departments, specifically public works, health, and the Office of Emergency Management to better align internal processes. Internal enterprise work will help de determine how the city can do better at both keeping community informed during a crisis and how we can really uh, bring in input and incorporate input from community during a crisis. It's really a two-way street information out and then learnings and information back in so that we can address um, community needs. With the new Office of Community Safety established now, a new Commissioner of Public Safety on board and a new police chief identified, pieces of work related to engaging community, residents and businesses um, must really be coordinated now with MPD and the new police chief and the broader Office of Community Safety. What is certain is that there is much room for growth in both how the city keeps community informed during a crisis, as well as how the city listens to community um, on their needs during a crisis. How we do better must be incorporated structurally, must be institutionalized within the city's new organizational structure so that it becomes part of the standard response, aligned with NIMS, and making sure that no matter who's in what particular position as a department leader or an elected leader, that this is really institutionalized and baked into the new structure. This will create clear expectations of community and of ourselves, the city, going forward. I would say that future recommendations that will be brought forth to council, um, including in first quarter of next year and ongoing um, through next year, will need to be aligned with the responding departments as well as with any emergency command centers that are established specifically supporting incident command. And I can stand for questions. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, Director, I just wanted to get some clarification. You said the recommendations, particularly around one, two, and three, specifically one, yep. um, will be coming out in the next two quarters. Is that correct? Uh, Chair Jenkins, Councilmember Wansley, uh, I would say that work has begun. Mm -hmm. um, the opportunity is still ahead of us in terms of there's been a lot of restructure. And so with a new Office of Community Safety lane of departments um, that is now starting to work together under 
uh, Commissioner Alexander's direction um, with a new police chief just on the horizon of coming on board. Um, we are, NCR Communications and other departments, the Office of Emergency Management is starting to dig into that now, but we are not yet at that point because we would want to definitely get the new police chief, um, Commissioner Alexander's um, thoughts um, on how to lead forward with community. So that is definitely the priority moving forward, and I would expect that certainly in first quarter of 2023, we would be able to give an update that would probably provide very solid direction on what that might look like, if possibly just short of an actual plan. Mm -hmm. But that is definitely a priority. I think more, so, yes, I definitely want the yeah. clarification on the timetable, because when you said two quarters, I'm thinking six months and thinking, could we literally be going into the third year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd um, and not have one community conversation about what took place? And I'm happy to hear that. It seems like there will be put some work put in place to make sure that we're not going into that third year mark um, without having that structure and intentional conversation that's been absent around how the community responded in that mom moment, the unresolved trauma that still sticks within many of our residents' communities and spirits from that moment. Um, so I'm happy to hear that we'll be at least getting an update and possibly a concrete plan around that early next year. Yes, Chair Jenkins, Councilmember Wallensley, I would say that that work has started already in this quarter and will continue, and yes, as soon as possible and early in next year. Thank you. I'm not seeing any others. Councilmember Chavez. Oh, I'm so if I could pause you. Councilmember Osman and then Chavez. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, in time of crisis, um, communication is very important, uh, especially uh, correct inf information to the resident. Uh, two questions, uh, how do you uh, respond to um, misinformation uh, residents are getting, not officially from the city, but um, you know, from the public or Twitter, or whatever is going on, like misinformation around, around, how do you tackle that? How do you correct that? What, you know, what ways can you, uh, uh, let the community know, hey, that's not what's happening. This is what's happening. This is what we're dealing with. And also, I think this is maybe I ask you many times this question: What is um, what is the city plan uh, in time of crisis? Communicating with uh, people that speak other than English, you know, is that a plan uh, forward on that? Sure. sure. Uh, Chair Jenkins, um, Councilmember Osman, thank you for those two questions. Um, I would say both of those answers are rooted in the Joint Information Center, Joint Information System that um, uh, we lead uh, moving forward. There is four sections within the Joint Information System, and again, that's NIMS compliant, and that's really in terms of how we're bringing in information, whether it's accurate or completely inaccurate misinformation, for instance. Um, we bring that in to the city, and we, um, verify that information. We work across the city, so it might be with MPD, it could be with Public Works, it could be with other partner agencies, for instance, that we are working in um, collaboration with um, to make sure that before we actually push out any messages or push out information, that that is information that is verified. That's why it's so important that um, we are doing uh, an excellent job of coordinating information mm -hmm. and sourcing information across departments across the enterprise as well as with other agencies that were working in partnership during a crisis such as civil unrest. Um, so that's, um, we know that there's misinformation out there. We have um, information monitoring within that as well. So we're seeing what's going on um, on Twitter, on Facebook, in community. Um, through the neighborhood relations section of the JIC or the GIS, um, we are bringing in information and then we are doing the job within the joint information system to push, create messages and push those messages out. But there is a very specific process for how we do that and that's why um, there is such a need to make sure that that information is coordinated through the joint information system. And then I would say regarding the second question, um, yes, we do have, um, uh, messaging that will go out in language, so we will identify uh, what audiences, what neighborhoods, what community members, who needs the information, and then of course we need to make sure that that information, the messages that are developed, 
are culturally appropriate, um, that makes sense to those audiences, and then of course are in language or sometimes visually communicated as well so that there's a quicker get for the information. But we know speed is, is very important, but also accuracy, and so we do a, our job of trying to make sure speed and accuracy are married together. Perfect, thank you. Councilmember Chavez. Uh, Chair Palmasano and uh, no, Councilman Osman literally just asked the same question I was going to ask, but I know in the summer of 2020, I was in multiple WhatsApp apps in Ward 9 on Lake Street with small business owners, constituents. I wasn't a council member at the time, but literally a lot of people that speak Spanish were using WhatsApp as a way to communicate because no one was talking to them. That's where people would coordinate come post up on this block and make sure that you come up with your own public safety plan, come to this block and protect that someone is coming, come to this block because our building is about to get looted, burned, all these things. And they had to come up with their own communication plan and their own public safety plan. And I think that I'm happy that you're talking about that we're gonna have these things in Spanish, English, and different languages. And I think one thing that will be really important is like how we get that message out. Is it through Facebook, Twitter, social media, emails, there's gonna have to be like this bigger question of like, we're gonna have to get that message across differently than <laughs> we would in other different communities. And I know for example on WhatsApp, like making sure we know which community leaders can disseminate that information, which news stations that speak different languages can spread that information. And I think that's one thing my office has been looking at, like when something bad is gonna happen, cause it's gonna happen again, that's just the city we live in we need to be really prepared and knowing who we're gonna reach out to so that the day that it comes again, it's not like, okay, who are we reaching out to? But we already have that list ready of like, boom, this is who we're talking to because we are prepared for this day already. But I guess my thing is like, thank you for the work that you're doing on, on reaching out to communities that don't speak English and knowing that we're gonna to have to be really creative and dig really deep on like where and how we're gonna reach out to them is gonna be really important. Um, Chair Jenkins, Councilmember Chavez, thank you for that um, question or for those um, comments. I think we take that seriously. That is the work still to come as we are working through uh, a crisis communications plan that exactly what you said, we need to identify the channels um, in the year 2023, um, uh, the appropriate holding messages, for instance. We know that despite, you know, we might not know what the crisis or the situation is, but there are some um, messages, broad-based messages that could be developed that can be translated in language because the goal, of course, with communications is not only to uh, get information out at the right time to the right um, audiences, but it is to do it so that it truly connects. If you send a message out in English that, or you know, is not culturally relevant or comes out at the wrong time, comes out too late, that's not keeping people safe and it's not engendering trust. So that's really at the root of the crisis communications plan that is just kind of at the beginning stages of being developed. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Um, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, that is the end of the presentation. If there are no further questions, we will um, return it back to you. I would like to thank all our presenters um, and you, Director Lane, for changing your schedules around um, to suit our Committee of the Whole Needs. We're trying to squeeze a lot of different topics in here by the end of the year, and you've moved up this presentation to accommodate us. So um, we look forward to seeing your written report later on, um, but for now, I'm not seeing any further discussion. So thank you. I'll ask the clerk to please file that report. And having completed both of our discussion items, we'll now receive reports from the standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council this Thursday, beginning with the budget committee chaired by Council Member Koski. Thank you, Madam President, or Madam Vice President. Sorry. At this point in the budget committee's process, we've received the mayor's recommended budget, a budget overview, and department presentations. Our next step will be to hold public hearings on the mayor's recommended budget. On November 10th at 10 a.m., we will hold public hearing number one at a budget committee meeting, and on November 15th at 6.05 p.m., we will hold public hearing number two at an adjourned city council meeting. After public hearings number one and two, council members will have between November 15th and November 23rd to meet with the budget director to review their draft amendments and until November 23rd at 5 p.m. to submit amendments to the budget director and I for consideration at a markup meeting. I'll remind council members that these due dates are not flexible. 
The Budget Committee will have markup meetings on December 1st at 10 a.m. and December 2nd at 10 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. And at the end of our markup meetings, we will send our final recommendations to the City Council. Then at another adjourned City Council meeting on December 6th at 6.05 p.m., we will hold public hearing number three, the Truth in Taxation hearing, and we will vote then on the final recommendation. As I shared at our last Budget Committee meeting, the City Council approved the Omnibus Government Structure Ordinance. The Omnibus Government Structure Ordinance included changes to our government structure that affect the Mayor's recommended budget. As a result, the Mayor is preparing an amendment to his recommended budget, which I will refer to as the Mayor's Government Structure Amendment. As Chair of the Budget Committee, I will introduce the Mayor's Government Structure Amendment at the beginning of Budget Committee's markup meetings. It is our intention the mayor, budget director, and I to provide council members with the mayor's government structure amendment as soon as possible so that council members are aware of its content when drafting their own amendments to the mayor's recommended budget. If council members have any questions about the process I've outlined, they can connect with me after the, this meeting today. With that, the budget committee is not forwarding any items to the city council at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Not seeing any questions, I'll move on to business inspections, housing, and zoning. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The business, house, business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee is going to bring forward 11 items for approval. Item number one is uh, Cambria Downtown Liquor License. Item two is Sweet Green Sidewalk Cafe License. Item three is Stock and Spade On Sale Wine and Strong Beer License. Item four is Black Bean Coffee a Sidewalk Cafe License. Item five are the regular liquor license approvals, and item six are the renewal. Item number seven is a land sale closing deadline uh, for a project at 2313 13th Avenue South. Item eight is exclusive development rights to JDAT development for a project at 18th and Bryant Avenue North. Item nine are the applications for environmental grant found funding in the 2022 fall Brownfield grant process. Item 10 is a commercial property development loan. And item 11 is a forgivable loan to McGizzy as part of the Clyde Bellacourt Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative. I'm happy to answer questions on any of those items. Unfortunately, after that, I need to go to the Curry Commons Groundbreaking, which is a new deeply affordable housing project in the Fifth Ward, where I will join Council Member Ellison. But I'll stand for questions first. Not seeing any. That's wonderful news. Um, Enjoy the groundbreaking. Next, we have the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. That committee report will be given by Councilmember Wanson. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice President. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 18 items. Um, the first being a passage of resolution related to the 2022 quarterly donations report. Number two is a passage of resolution related to revisions to residential loan subordination policy. Number three is authorizing issuance of requests for proposals for engineering and design services for Nicolette Avenue street construction and bridge reconstruction. Number four is authorizing the issuance of requests for proposals for group violence intervention support and outreach services. Number five is authorizing the issuance of requests for proposals for public art project manager pool. Number six is accepting a bid for meeting and banquet chairs. Number seven is a bid for Minneapolis Convention Center corridor ceiling replacement project. Number eight is accepting bids for citywide public safety camera network repair and maintenance. Number nine is accepting a bid for official advertising services. Number 10 is authorizing contract with Olson and Nesville Engineers PSC for engineering and design services for 10th Avenue Bridge over the Midtown Greenway. Number 11 is authorizing contracts to establish a executive recruitment services pool for executive search services. Number 12 is authorizing a lease extension with Sprint Spectrum Realty Company LLC to operate personal communication service antenna systems on the Orchestra Hall parking ramp. Number 13 is approving a legal settlement with Minnehaha Academy versus the city of Minneapolis. Number 14 is approving another legal settlement, a workers' compensation claim of Jared Smith. Number 15 is approving a legal settlement for a workers' compensation claim of Joshua Johnson. Number 16 is approving a legal settlement, workers' compensation claim of John Owen. Number 17 is approving a legal settlement, a workers' compensation claim of Brian Min. 
And number 18 is being forwarded uh, without recommendation for considering a contract with West Publishing Corporation for online research subscription services. Um, and with that, I will stand for any questions on these items. Thank you. Not seeing any. Next, we have the Public Health and Safety Committee report given by Chair Latricia Vita. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward one item that it's recommending for approval. The item is the appointment of Brian O'Hara to the Chief of Police Department. Um, that is our only item, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Next, we have the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee that will be read by Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee will be bringing forward four items that it is recommending for approval. The first is approving the layout and easement for the First Avenue South Street reconstruction project from Lake Street to Grant Street. Number two is approving the layout and easements for the Hiawatha Avenue and Lake Street intersection improvements project from 22nd Avenue South to Snelling Avenue. Number three is authorizing a cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for the 42nd Street safety improvement projects, and number four, adopting the 2022 levy of various Public Works Department special assessments. And I will stand for any questions. Thank you. Um, last but not least, I want to just give a quick heads up that at the council meeting on Friday, we have a few requests for close, sorry, Thursday, we have a few requests for closed council items at the end of that meeting, so please take a look at your calendars accordingly. Um, with that, we've concluded all business to come before committee today, and hearing no objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.